What if your IT service desk helped you put your customers first? It can happen when it's powered by the world's most trusted cloud platform. Industry leaders BMC Software and Salesforce.com offer the fastest growing IT service management solution in the market today, RemedyForce. Let's meet Sally. Last week, Sally requested an iPhone by logging a ticket using the hashtag request capability found exclusively in RemedyForce. IT got a request and Sally got her iPhone. All was good until her mobile email stopped working. No worries. Sally jumps on to the Remedy Force self-service portal, and before submitting a service request, she checks out the article section and quickly finds a possible solution to her problem by resetting her phone. Sally finds easy-to-follow, step-by-step instructions on how to remove and reinsert her SIM card. In this case, resetting her iPhone didn't work, so Sally decides to get help from IT. She gives some information about her problem and submits the service ticket. It's instantly routed to a service desk agent. Now, as an agent, you can start to get more information about Sally's problem. You can quickly tell if there's a problem on a larger scale. Right away, you notice there's planned maintenance. And diving deeper, you see there's a problem associated with the server and email on mobile devices. It also looks like someone has already issued a request for change, so you check out the latest status. Good news, there's a rollout plan, a backup plan, and information about who approved the change. It looks like Sally's email will be back up and running in no time. That makes Sally happy, and you a hero. Email is just one of the many critical business services your customers rely on. And with RemedyForce, you can monitor the status of any business or IT service at a glance. Deployment is fast and easy with no hardware or software to manage. Upgrades are automatic, so you'll always be on the newest version with the latest features. And Remedy Force is accessible to customers anywhere, anytime, on any device. Keep your employees happy and your business thriving. Try Remedy Force today. Good morning, or good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you might be in the world. Hi, my name is Mark Fitzgerald, and I'm coming from uh, Boise, Idaho, to talk about making sense out of information chaos. It's a pleasure to be part of the conference this day and actually talk about some of the different things that we're facing, not only in the IT industry, but in the world in general. I mean, certainly information is king, and information is power. But with so much information at our fingertips, how do you make sense of it all? How do you keep up with everything that really is being bombarded to you? That's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about tips for keeping track of information, or keeping up with information, but really talk about knowledge management and not just within uh, our professional lives, but to talk about knowledge in general, how we teach knowledge, how we manage knowledge, in a general sense, and then be able to apply it to the IT world. First of all, let's uh, talk a bit about Boise State and who Boise State is and who I am. Like I said, my name's Mark Fitzgerald. I've been in the IT community uh, going on 20 years now and specifically aimed in at that first tier support and support services, whether it be desktop support, whether it be help desks, and I've really focused my career in on the higher ed sector. And that higher ed sector uh, in the United States has really been a barometer for what are things to come in businesses five, ten years out. Uh, Boise State University, on the other hand, is uh, a fairly young university at 75 years old, has really been shaping the Treasure Valley and the Idaho landscape and really beginning to set foot on the national stage. Boise State is known within the United States for its football team and its blue field, but really it's a cutting edge leading research institution for 22,000 students and one of the driving factors uh, in the West. And being part of Boise State, I've had the opportunity of managing uh, not only their help desk and desktop support, but what we call the University Help Desk of Distinction. It is really a help desk that's aimed at being part of the academic process and part of the mission of Boise State University. 
Today, what I want to start with are some of the words of a professor from Abilene Christian University. His name is Bill Rankin, and he's really been taking a look at the history of information. And what I appreciate about Bill Rankin, Dr. Rankin is looking at three different things to say, what are we doing today with information? And he would claim that we are in the third age of information. If you get a uh, chance, make sure to see on YouTube, Bill Rankin's full explanation of the three ages of information, because it will put into context some of my words that I'm going to share with you today. So let's talk about with what he calls the age of hand. The information age of hands is when things were all created and stored by hand, writing on a scroll or on parchment, writing on a cave wall, books, but handwritten books more particularly. And these technologies had a problem. They had an informational problem. And that was, how does one access information? You think about it, you pr produce one document, how do we get that to somebody? Really, people had to travel to find that information. If you were in Rome and you wanted that information and that information was in Jerusalem, you needed to travel to Jerusalem to be able to find the people and the documents that had the information that you were looking for. This was a tremendous problem for thousands of years, and it took a long time to find technologies to overcome these problems. And it formed a particular teaching style or a te teaching methodology to address the information problem of the age of hands. And that was a master and apprentice system. And this system of learning and teaching went on for generations and thousands of years. If you wanted to learn something, you needed to find someone to teach it to you. And that master and that apprentice often lived together. They formed a symbiotic relationship in which the apprentice was fully dependent on the master to teach them things that they didn't know, nuances. If you wanted to learn to farm, and you were an apprentice to a farmer, you would learn different things about the soil. You would learn how the climate worked. You'd learn all of these different things until you became a master quality person and could take on your own apprentices. If the master didn't take on an apprentice, their knowledge would pass and would be lost from society. They were dependent on the abilities of one another to be able to learn the information in the age of hands. The technology they used to solve the age of hands was the printing press. And it actually entered in the information age of machines. But with a new technology became new problems. Now people could travel, the information could travel to the people. Libraries could grow, and libraries did grow, first from a couple of books to tens of books, to dozens, to hundreds, to thousands, to today, we have libraries with millions of books. It also changed the way we taught. Classes and universities were formed in which a teacher, a fount of knowledge, would be in the front of the class. And that teacher would challenge the class by presenting them information and asking them to memorize those facts. Why would they memorize facts? Why? Because they wanted to solve the problem of the machine age of machines. And that is searching and finding information. Any one of you that had a term paper or a research paper, especially in the college environment, knew how long a research paper could take to write. Most of it was searching and finding for information. You would go to the library and say, I want to research a particular topic. And you weren't quite sure where to start. You might look around the library and might find the section that has some information, but more often than not, you needed to find out what librarians called a given topic. And once you had a common codice, you could then go to a card catalog and look for that uh, information and start thumbing through the books there, find a section in the library, 
find the book, read through the entire book only to find it wasn't what you were looking for and a nuance of a different type of classification or catalog was needed. Different technologies were there to aid, whether it be a table of context, context whether it be an index, or whether something like an encyclopedia that would give you little snippets of where you should look for further information. But it certainly was highlighting the problem of the age of machines, which was searching and finding information. And the more you could memorize, the easier and faster it was because you didn't have to search and find that information. This was wholly dependent on a categorization and classification system. And we saw this extend past just books or knowledge or information. People would categorize their lives. This is an issue for work, or it's part of my personal life, or my professional life, or I do those things at church or within my community. And we would categorize and segment our lives. And ushering computers into the picture, we see a change. It's harder to have separation between work and home, school and play. Our classification and categorization is failing us, and we don't have clean breaks. And that's because information is coming faster and we can handle it. In the information age of data, people are saturated in information. And we found by addressing the problem of searching and finding, we've created a new problem, assessing information, how to make sense of the data that we're drowning in. What is real? What isn't? What is relevant? What can we ignore? Those same problems extend to the classroom and teaching methodology. What can we trust? Is the teacher telling me the truth? I have data here on my screen in front of me that says what they're telling me is three years out of date. Can I trust the fount of knowledge in front of the room? This also extends into the professional and work arena. I have conflicting information coming from three different sources within my business. Who do I trust? What information is relevant? What is timely? What should I be working on? Are all problems the information age of data? We need to be able to learn to assess information for its quality, its accuracy, and its information. But in some ways, we've returned full circle. In many things within the IT arena, where we can kind of see it like a pendulum, where it swings from one end to the other. We might be in a centralized environment today to know that three, four years down the road, that pendulum is going to swing back to a decentralized environment. That's, we've seen this with mainframes. We've seen this with organizational structure. It also goes to the way we teach. Pendulum has swung back to requiring somewhat of a master and apprentice situation. But each time the pendulum swings, it's a little bit different. As we are returning back to a mentoring situation in which we really want a master and apprentice, it comes not with living together as it was back in the age of hands, but through relationships, because relationships establish credibility. And one of the fascinating things about relationships today is relationships can exist with both people and organizations. A single apprentice can have relationships with dozens of masters to be successful, becoming a master themselves much quicker and much greater than any one of the masters that they were an apprentice to. Bill Rankin, in his video, cited the American Library Association that by 2020, information on the internet will double every 15 minutes. And he equated a university professor going into an hour long lecture saying, how out of date will the information that he's teaching at the beginning of the lecture be at the end of an hour if information is doubling every 15 minute? That's exponential. 
it leads you to pose the question as a knowledge worker, and I would contend we are all knowledge workers. If you see your primary job as to serve information, are you helping to solve the current informational problem or are you making it worse? Simply giving information is no longer what our employees are searching for. They need ways and models to assess information. The information's there and it's coming from all sources. What should they trust? And as kind of anecdotal, when I see a big statement like by 2020, information on the internet will double every 15 minutes, I question that. That is a pretty lofty statement. So I wanted to see the context and get a little bit more understanding of what this meant. And despite my best searching on the American Library Association website, I couldn't find this quote. Now, I don't want to cast doubt on Dr. Rankin. I have tremendous amount of respect for him and his work. But it leads me to ask the question, if I can't find the source of the information, can I trust the information? Just because there's a picture of a famous person, and I love this quote from Abraham Lincoln, and I'm sure it's authentic, just because I read it on the internet and it had a picture and a quotation next to it, doesn't mean I should trust it. In comes Google or Bing or Yahoo or any of your other providers out there of searching for information. An internet search engine is one powerful, powerful tool because it takes lots of information and helps you find what you are looking for. It was the real solution to the age of machines. But it also issued in a problem, and that problem was illustrated by Brian Fitzgerald, and what he created was the Pi Principle. And the Pi Principle really is the concept of one plus one can equal 12. Now, Brian being a, a fourth grader at the time that he developed this principle, tried to explain that one plus one equals 12 to his teacher. And the concept was that if you have one pie, but that pie is divided into six slices, and you take another pie, which also is divided into six slices, one plus one actually equals 12 slices. The point is we all see the world very differently. Brian's teacher couldn't grasp this. She did not want to hear it because one plus one equals two. I think you could equally contend with this particular picture that one plus one equals six because there's six different slices or types of pies. One plus one could equal whatever that you see that it is. It could be the numbers of cherries or pecans, could be the types of ingredients used. The point being is we look at a picture and we all see it differently. And this poses a tremendous problem for finding and assessing information because one thing that is crystal clear to me may not make any sense to you. And as a manager, if we're not willing to listen to why one plus one equals 12, we're failing to have teaching moments. We're failing to understand because we're only looking at the world in one way. So I walked around the office last week, took my cell phone out of my pocket, which happens to be a Nexus 4, and I walked up to the first cubicle in the row and said, what is this? Can you give me a name for it? The first answer was a Nexus. Person happened to know pretty much which phone I was using. So I walked to the next person. Another person said an Android, a Galaxy, a Droid. My favorite answer, not an iPhone. And then from one of our younger student employees, a brick, because apparently my uh, one-year-old cell phone is uh, 
not cutting edge enough. It is, it's uh, old enough to be called a brick. The point though, that I wanna emphasize here is no one said smartphone. If we apply this to the IT world and creating knowledge bases for that first tier to use, or even subsequent tiers, we want to classify and categorize everything for findability, for searchability, and so we categorize this as a smartphone or whatever our sort of this catalog would tell it to be called. The problem though, no one called this a smartphone. So if they're searching for an issue on a Nexus 4, in my knowledge base, they're not going to find it. Now, people would contend that's what keywords are for. That's what uh, metadata is for. But the problem is, how do we know all of the things to put in there until somebody can't find it and is frustrated because they're still dealing with the problems of the last information age, when in reality, they're really dealing with the problem of the current information age. There is so much information that it becomes fragmented and hard to understand. What you're looking here is a visualization of the Android cell phone market. Each one of these boxes represents a device and a flavor of Android, which is unique to that device. This makes the Apple uh, iPhone market look wonderfully simplistic. But the point being here is, of not too many years ago, we would have said, I need one of every single device at the help desk to be able to support it because they need to be able to play on the device and touch it and feel it and give it a hug before that they could support it. Categorization and classification breaks down and fails with the fragmentation and overwhelmingness of information. To be able to support a cell phone or a smartphone or a Nexus 4, we need to be teaching information models that teach the principles of how cell phone works. If we teach models information, we can then guide and help people apply different models and select the correct one to the correct situation. It's no longer about pinpoint knowledge for every single situation because we can't forecast every single situation that we find ourselves in. Applying this to the outside world, students need to be taught real world learning and how to apply information rather than a memorization of facts to continue to evolve. Now, every once in a while, Boise State gives me the unique opportunity of teaching classes here on campus. It's fun to be an adjunct professor. But students aren't clamoring for memorization. They're not clamoring for a comprehensive final exam. Sure, they will look and they will ask for an open book exam. They're looking for that quick and easy formula rather than an exhaustive memorization. But what is society needs? Society needs that they understand how information applies. We need them to be able to work and uh, to be able to apply that information. We need them to be able to really understand the principles of it. Dan Meyer on a TED talk really addressed the age of information when talking about teaching mathematics. And you can find his full explanation also on YouTube and I highly recommend that 10 minute video when we apply it to what I'm talking about though, we find that teaching technologies from the age of machines when used in the age of data, give us several problems. Students will lack initiative. They'll lack perseverance. Things are coming too fast. If we can't uh, sum it up in a sound bite, it must not be worth it. Well, I don't know about your your business or the things that you face in your world, but I can tell you the things that I'm trying to fix 
aren't summed up in sound bites. They're much deeper than that. And I want them to be much more strategic than that. People lack retention when they focus on the technologies of the age of machines in the age of data. There's aversion to word problems because they don't seem relevant. They seem abstract in an age of multimedia, in an age of everything video, graphics, and lights. Long paragraphs of uh, word problems don't make a lot of sense. They don't seem real world. And there's an eagerness for a simplistic formula. There isn't a simplistic formula to solve the issues of life. So we have to ask, how does one assess the information or where does credibility come from? What you're looking at is a blog posting. And it happens to be my blog that I've begun writing, not for information management, but because I want to take a vacation. And I particularly enjoy travel, but I couldn't find information that I was looking for in a format that spoke to me. There was something lacking as I was looking for details of visiting different things in London. And I began to create my own personal knowledge base. What my blog posting is are my notes, my notes that I'm willing to share with others, others who think like me and would benefit from understanding the things that I was searching for. Now we all look for different things. Let's think back to the pie principle. We may see a single pie. We may see many slices. I was looking for finer details that were encompassed and little nuggets here and there across different websites. Couldn't find one source of information that summed up everything I was looking for. And so as I've built my own personal knowledge base and I've shared it out there, how do people know whether that's relevant or not? To be quite frankly, or to, to be quite honest, I haven't been to all of these places that I've blogged about. What sort of credibility is it come down to pretty pictures and uh, convincing writing? That certainly can influence people, but it is, I would contend more about the relationship because as I share this out there, people who know me and find it may read it and say, ah, I know and trust Mark. And I know that he does a lot of research and I can, I can rely on that information. And as they begin to rely on that, they will lend their credibility to it by reposting it or commenting on it and improving it. And we see that in what Google is doing out there as well. As you think about search engine optimization, the little people know about Google's analytics, or not analytics, their optimization and their algorithms is that it's reliant on a couple of different factors, not just keywords. Once you have the keywords in your metadata posted, your website will be searched and indexed, and it's in there with thousands of others. How it's determined to be put towards the top includes things like social media and includes links from other websites. And why does Google do this? Because it is racking up who has commented on it. It is racking up if people trust it and have posted, especially uh, websites that have already garnered trust will relink to it. It's lending credibility to that information. And we also see the aspect of things like multimedia by putting my picture next to the link, Google is establishing a level of credibility saying this person is responsible for this information. And if you happen to know Mark Fitzgerald, you can trust this information. And I find it equally interesting to go to the next link down, the one from TripAdvisor. We see four and a half stars here for the HMS Belfast in London. What Google's doing there is saying that in lieu of having the credibility of an individual, we can take the credibility of the masses. 
with 664 reviews, information such as the Wikipedia model is corrected and the poor information or the incorrect information is weeded out over time as people reinforce the correct information and the masses govern the knowledge. So as we think about relationships, they come from all parts of our lives and we're influenced by many people. And this comes out to play in the workforce more than anything, because I do have a professional sphere of influence. I have superiors, I have peers, subordinates. I have people that I've networked with. There's people out in the community, at a church, fellowships, uh, government that I interact with. I have people in my private personal life, family and friends that I talk to about IT work, for example. I greatly trust my brothers, all who of which have an influence on IT in their different organizations. They help shape some of the things that I talk about and do professionally. Likewise, things that I've learned from superiors have deeply shaped my private life and the way that I no longer try to balance my life, but to blend my life together. And these different things of influence create credibility for the knowledge that I both consume and that I both share. But for better or for worse, this creates an information bubble. Another TED Talk, Eli Perisner, talks about the problems of information bubbles. Whether it's a problem or not, you need an information bubble. Because if you do not cap or limit the information, you will drown in information. The problem is how big or how small do you make your information bubble? Let me go back and explain what an information bubble is. These filter bubbles is that as you share information online, let's say on Facebook or on Flipboard, people begin to share with you and you find that you're limiting to those that you just agree with. And pretty soon you're creating your own microcosm of reality. But as we take that and apply that, let's say to a business IT setting, you need to find different sources inside and outside your business in order to trust. If you're search, solely searching the internet, every time you have a question, you're going to be slowed down because of too much information. You're speed, sped up and get more credibility by relying on the experiences of others that you trust. And by finding those, you're taking their information bubble and merging it with yours to more quickly assess information, more quickly understand and grasp it because they speak in a common language that you're used to understanding. I actually really appreciated uh, Mauricio Corona's talk before my presentation. His presentation was timely, it was informational, it was a quality presentation but it was in Spanish. Not everybody speaks Spanish. That was a hard information bubble for some people to consume because it wasn't in a language they could understand quite literally. But when people speak in a language you can understand, both figuratively and literally, it helps you grow your bubble and understand and rely on their credibility. As leaders, we really need to assess and think about five points. We need to be able to teach models of information, not spout off information ourselves. More and more, I look at the model of help desks that have been so common for the past 20 years, set up with line employees surrounded by a supervisor or a call center manager that is the fount of information. And as useful as that is, 
does it really serve your business in a day of information? Or can we replace them with Google? Well, I'm not sure we can replace them with Google. We still need to be able to teach models of information so they can assess the information. Simply having a robot parrot out the correct answer often will mask problems that you're facing. We need to help workers select which model to use in which context. We no longer need one of every cell phone to be able to support cell phones. We need to be able to switch gears and put on our cell phone hat different than our operating system hat or different than our uh, supporting our LMS or our ERP hat. We have to use the correct model for the correct context we're in. Now this applies in all of society. How many of us have gone to a doctor and have been frustrated because they really haven't used a model for gathering and assessing information. They've simply said, ah, uh, this sounds like something else I've seen before, here, have a pill. We're all knowledge workers and we need to assess the information that's being presented to us. We need to grasp and understand that inform information is fragmented and it's deeply individualized. It's personal. And if we don't understand that information is personal and allow it to be personal, we're going to struggle and drown in information. We need to learn how to help people work collaboratively in teams. And we need to operate independently. What do I appreciate about Bill Rankin and, and, and Dan Meyer is that they fully understand that in order to learn, you need to be able to debate and talk things out. And the reason I see that you need to be able to discuss information is helps you internalize it. And it helps you put it into your own voice and own understanding. Again, coming back to the pie principle from Brian Fitzgerald. As you look at the situation and you discuss it and you have that opportunity to talk it out, it becomes yours and you see it in the way that you can see it. And yet, even though you see it with your own eyes, it gives you the opportunity of coming to an understanding of how somebody else sees it. And you both can come to a common understanding, even though in my mind, one and one equals two. And in your mind, one and one equals 12. And we need to recognize the credibility that comes from relationships and relationship building. So what about my knowledge base? For 20, 25 years, we've been trying to create knowledge bases, especially in the IT community, of being able to document what we've learned. Knowledge bases, in my mind, aren't a thing of the past. They are crucial and key to the future. But we need to define what a knowledge base is. A knowledge base isn't solely, hey, Here's my database of ask a, uh, or input an error code, get an answer. They're much more comprehensive than that. They're three dimensional because there are so many different types of knowledge. And yes, we may have a knowledge base of break fix information or incident data in the ITEL world, but life and understanding of incidents is far more than the sterile environment of a break fix knowledge base. Is it social? And when I say, is it social, that means all sorts of things to all sorts of people. This is what it means to me. Is there credit of who wrote your knowledge base article? Think back to the Google search in which you saw my picture and my name next to the article in the search results. If I do a search in my organization and I see the pictures of three or four of the desktop support agents that have helped me, I might have a relationship or trust with one that did a particularly good job. Which one of the knowledge base articles am I gonna trust more? 
I'm going to go for the person I know first. So providing credit is important. Likewise, providing credit to know because maybe I had an information exchange with an individual that I didn't trust. Having credit from them allows me to more quickly filter and assess that information. Is commenting enabled? This goes back to um, the Wikipedia concept. Can people uh, comment on there and say, hey, listen, this works here, but it doesn't work in this situation. They're providing context and beginning to add their language to your document. Can it be uh, rated? Goes back to what we were talking about with uh, TripAdvisor. Can I use the masses to be able to tell us what is good and what is bad? Now, if I was using this in my organization, it wouldn't just be my IT staff or the front line. Can the entire organization rate it? Can the entire organization comment on it? Can they pose a question saying, I'm trying to fix X, and this seems like it does apply, but it doesn't work. What am I missing? To help ferret out different responses. Does it use multimedia? Now, multimedia whether it's video, audio, pictures, is crucial because so many of us are adverse to word problems. Just seeing text, especially a large page, a page of text, I'm gonna hit Control F on my keyboard and find the word I'm looking for and only read maybe the paragraph or the sentence above and below it because I want to filter, I want to go quicker but I'm much more tolerant to watch an entire YouTube video. I think of my wife that uh, decided that she was going to be the master handyman at home through YouTube, and she has no problem field stripping our dishwasher and taking out a broken part and replacing it because she's armed with the credibility of things that she can see and hear and not only read about. It's a powerful, powerful tool. As we apply that to what some of the things we've done here at Boise State, it's much more powerful to be able to record your knowledge base article and send it out to the team and say, this is what I'm seeing and this is how I solved it. We do have problems that you need to do the appropriate things to index something like that. It does create additional burdens, but the credibility and the information transfer goes up exponentially. Can sources throughout the internet be cited as relevant and then indexed within your knowledge base? Now, a lot of manufacturers of knowledge base out there will tout something like this, but really I'm thinking of something like Pinterest. And I can hear the collective groan of people saying, Pinterest, really? But where you can Recording take- has stopped. Has stopped. When you can take relevant information, recording has started. When you can take relevant information and pin it to your index and share it with others and saying, I validated this information, how important is it? Is your searchability as powerful as Google, Bing, or Yahoo or the like? Is it the most used floating to the top? Can you create gamification and turn it into a game? These are all important social aspects of how we govern our knowledge. Is it open to the entire organization to create content? These principles apply all over to our schools and to our teachers, to our families and to our friends. We need to ask, can we control data? Can we contain it? Or do we live in a completely open world? What technologies are already being worked on to overcome the age of data problems? And will it issue in a new age? Are we continually behind the eight ball? How do you keep from being fooled? Just because thousands of people think it's true doesn't mean it's accurate. Knowledge is power. And we're being overflown and drowned in knowledge and information. We need to be able to filter and assess that information to be successful. And we need to teach that to those that we work with if we want our organization to be successful. I thank you for your time today and we'll take a, a 
a look at just a few questions as we only have a minute left. And let me make one quick modification here. And as we take a look, and I'm not seeing any questions out there, if you do have questions, feel free to uh, contact me. Uh, I'm available on Google+, I'm available on Twitter, and uh, I believe all of that contact information is shared out as part of the conference. I thank you all and the, the leaders of the group to, uh, to put this conference on. It's been a powerful and wonderful experience to put together this presentation. Thank you.